We're winding down on a trip around the world of every single continent having five great reptile pets. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the best pets from those individual continents and regions, just that they are five great pets. And today we're gonna to talk about a region that we already talked about, mainland. We're gonna do Southeast Asia. So before we did essentially mainland Asia, we got a lot of like the kind of India area, parts of like Central Asia into a little bit. Now we're talking about Southeastern, so into Southern Thailand and Vietnam and a lot of the parts of the islands off the coast of Asia, including Micronesia and a lot of those small islands, even to like the Philippines and Polynesia and places like that. So without further ado, we're gonna talk about five great reptile pets from Southeast Asia. The first one, I know some people might immediately think of me like I'm a crazy pants, but stick with me just like every other one on this list and all the other ones in general, because I have reasons for why I put every single one on this list. And so to start this off with, we're actually gonna do a group of them, and that is the Bloods and the short tail Pythons. So there are essentially three different species that we work with here in the United States and really around the world in the reptile hobby in general. And that is, and they are found in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Borneo, and Sumatra. So essentially, there are the three different kinds. There are the Borneo short tails, there are the blood pythons, where, you know, their namesake from, and the Sumatran short tails, and those are the black bloods. So out of those three, they all have a really bad reputation for being nasty and being bitey and defensive and strikey, and they're just not great animals to keep, especially for a novice keeper. Well, while I will admit that they may not be the best for a novice keeper, that rep is 100% undeserved, especially in recent times. A lot of the short tail pythons and the bloods have become very popular, especially in the last 10 years or so in the hobby. And captive breeding, just like some of the other animals we've talked about in other lists, have made for an animal that's almost entirely unlike its wild counterpart. So yes, if you did get a Sumatran blood, one of the, one of the black bloods, if you ordered one of those in, or you get another wild caught animal for a cheaper price because imports are almost always a little bit less expensive, then you are probably gonna get an animal that not only comes with parasites and things like that, an animal that doesn't have that inherent tolerance for handling and human interactions. And in addition to that, and to essentially an entirely different animal as far as temperament and behavior goes, there's been a ton of morphs that have been introduced, especially into the bloods and the short tails. So, you know, there's the Matrix and the 007 with those golden eyes. I think it's actually called golden eye, I just say 007. Those golden eyed ones, T positive, T negatives, a bunch of really cool stuff. Now, that being said, while I do say that they can make great pets, and honestly, they're really cool. They're a shorter python, rarely exceeding five feet. Um, they're really heavy bodied. They're almost like the anaconda of Asia. I've heard people refer to them as that. They really love water. They love humidity. They don't get as long as a lot of the other animals in that area, i.e. reticulated pythons and Burmese pythons, but they are still a good heavy bodied snake but they don't get very long. So when you want to keep them, you have to remember it's a big bodied snake that doesn't climb a lot. So you don't need a tall enclosure. You need a much wider and longer one with a good sized water source and lots of humidity. Now, a lot of people can have trouble at this point because like some other snakes that I've talked about before, like rainbow boas and a lot of those animals where they don't need as high temps, like a basking spot at 90 is honestly a little warm for them. You want to keep stuff in the kind of the mid 80s and a lot of people do have trouble getting that humidity and temperature balance without getting it either to stagnate or anything like that. But with a little bit of practice, lots of research, talking to a good breeder, which I 100% recommend doing if you in fact want to get one of these animals, there are quite a few very reputable, well-known short tail and blood breeders out there that I will personally recommend as well that you go and seek out before you know buying one on auction online or something like that. Um, but once you do that, do find your breeder, you've done your research, you talk to them, you brought one home, there are a couple things that are kind of a little odd about them. Number one is that if you get a little baby, if you ever decide to breed, a lot of times they will start to eat several meals and it will be a considerable amount of time before they have their first shed, which is unnerving to people. Another thing about them is that they don't actually poop regularly either. A lot of times they, blood pythons in general, eat smaller meals than you might think. They just kind of have a lot of mass but they usually will turn their noses up to a larger meal. So for uh, you know a similar ball python or reticulated python that has a, that size of body mass, 
that same size Borneo or short tail wolf, uh, short tail or blood will throw their nose up in the air if offered a larger meal, but they will eat quite a few meals and not actually have a bowel movement. In fact, a lot of times for a mature adult, they'll only do it a couple times a year, which that means when it happens, it's everywhere. But if you can tolerate that, if you can deal with a little bit of some of those, you know, eccentricities that make them a little bit different than a lot of other python species that we have, they are an amazing animal to have. And they are a decent display species. They're not gonna be climbing up in the trees, but if you have a nice, cool little terrarium to out enclosure, they are almost always prominent either in their water. They're not usually under their hides once they get a little bit older and larger and a little bit more bold, but you'll see them all the time. And some of those animals with those mature colorations and even the morphs too, they look amazing. And if you do in fact want to go learn a little bit more about them, I did a whole podcast last year with Bloods by Design, one of the premier blood and Borneo and short tail people that, at least in my opinion, that is out there in the States right now, as well as check out uh, Philly Herpticulture or Philly Herps, I think is the other one, where we've all actually learned a lot from them as well. This next one is definitely the most well-known and probably the best beginner, as well as arguably one of the better pet reptiles on this list, and that is gargoyle geckos. So gargoyle geckos are a type of New Caledonian gecko. They're in the same genus as like the Lichianus or the giant geckos. For a long time, they were considered part of the crested geckos as well, but they've determined the crested geckos are in another one off to the side, but so like lychees and gargoyles are much more closely related. The gargoyle gecko is very similar to the crusties, which is why we know a lot about them and why for a long time they considered them related to them. They are fairly nocturnal, although they do benefit from a lot of, and they do exhibit a lot of behavior of cryptic basking. So where they will start to just poke out a little bit of them like a leg or their tails or just a small portion of their body out of their hides during the evening, the late part of the afternoon, right before the lights go out, they'll have a little bit of them exposed, but for the most part, they are fairly nocturnal. They're most active during the night. Um, they do benefit from very tall enclosures because they're arboreal. They have those awesome little toe pads that are full of little microscopic hairs that make those electromagnetic fields. They can climb on that. Their toes are basically useless. Um, they are a little bit bigger than crested geckos, so they're in that like five to nine inch range. So like a large gecko is basically like just over from like here to here, because my hand is about nine inches or so. So like a big, big boy would be just a tiny bit longer than this. And they're 50 to 70 grams. They can be sometimes as large as 90. As far as I'm aware, there aren't too many that break 100. Although some gargoyle people out there who are much more versed than I am will probably tell me I'm wrong. Um, just be nice about it, please. I'm very sensitive. Um, they are great though. They are great candidates for bioactive and well planted out or realistic or naturalistic terrariums. They are fairly handleable. They don't drop their tails nearly as readily as crested geckos. So as far as handleability goes, probably a little bit more so. Um, however, they do have larger heads and a little bit sharper teeth because in the wild, they actually have a little bit more of a carnivorous diet. They eat more insects than crusties as well as they will eat smaller geckos as well. So a little bit sharper teeth, bigger head, and they do, so if they do bite, it might be a little bit worse than a crecko than a crested gecko bite, but nothing serious at all. Um, and then the last little bit is that if you ever decide to breed these, there are all sorts of crazy lines and things going on with the gargoyle geckos. As far as I'm aware, there's not any true morphs. They basically come in one of two different patterns. It's either a blotched or a, or a modeled pattern or a striped one. And they've done select line breeding to where they have very specific bloodlines that are even named after really cool stuff like the Dracula bloodline and the Deadpool bloodline that throw higher colored offspring down the road. However, gargoyle geckos do have a bad habit of kind of biting into each other and sometimes ripping off tails while breeding. So if that is something you want to do and you want to get into those really cool like a Deadpool Dracula line, because I'm going to remake a Marvel comic book, uh, gargoyle, that you want to keep an eye on them when you do pair them together because they do have a tendency to kind of tear into each other a little bit so you do want to watch that this one is probably a lot of people's most controversial take but it's not my most controversial take of this list and this one is the dwarf reticulated pythons now i want to be very specific about why i think they can make great pets and i'm going to get into that so don't don't crucify me just yet so 
when we're talking about the dwarf retic python. So those are the ones that come from the islands of Indonesia and Micronesia off the coast of mainland Asia, that due to the islands having smaller prey items, no large predators, the snakes there didn't get as large as their mainland counterparts. So they have much smaller size overall, even into adulthood. And some of those island locales are very distinct. And there's a very popular, deservedly, dwarf retic breeder that we're at this point probably all thinking about. And after this, you should probably go check out their stuff as well as the new US Art channel that they just started up. So you should probably go check out Reach and Reptiles and all that. However, that being said, when we very first got the dwarf retics, they had a really bad reputation, just like the mainland retics when we first got them, of being nasty, musky, bitey, defensive striking animals. But just like with mainland retics, just like with the Borneo short tails that we talked about before, selective breeding and consistent generations in their human captivity has led to a dramatic, drastic change of dwarf reticulated python and super dwarf reticulated python behavior and temperament. They are, they can be amazing snakes. I've held small neonate dwarf retics before and they act just like little baby bows. A little reactive at first, but very quickly figure out that you're not gonna eat them and they chill right out. Great, great animals. In addition to those really cool localities, they're starting to put in some of the main land genetics into there where we're starting to get those crazy colors and patterns and morphs. I think, I think he's even starting to go into like a cow um, and the pides and things like that. So eventually we're gonna have, instead of that 15 to 20 foot, although there's not a whole lot of 20 foot reticular pythons out there, but then, you know, that 12 to 18 foot animal that honestly a lot of people should probably rethink if they want to get a few of those into a much more manageable size. In fact, some of them are as small as six feet, although a lot of them, a lot of the dwarf localities, especially the ones that are starting to get that mainline blood of the different genetics put in there, the nine to 10 foot range is much more common. However, a nine to 10 foot snake of a little bit more of a slender body um, is a much more manageable and handleable package than a giant mainland reticulated python. So that's why I think they make great pets because essentially, just like the mainlands, that they can be very tolerant and very handleable animals if worked with, they have the ability to actually do that much more than the mainlands because that can continue into a much more handleable and manageable package. Now, I'm not too sure if too many people have heard of this next one, but I think a little bit of spotlight needs to be shined on this animal, and that is the mountain horn lizard, sometimes called the mountain horn dragon. Now, there are several different species, even from a couple different genuses that are all considered or classified as this mountain horn lizard. They're found because, again, there are quite a few different species of them. They're found throughout a good majority of Southeast Asia. So, Southern Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and to some of the islands off the coast of Asia. And they all, most of them, have very similar look to them, as well as very similar care and needs. So when you very first think about it, obviously the horn part. So they have these really cool, impressive spikes running along the back of their heads, down the back of their necks, as well as some of them even have them over the tops of their eyes, which gives them that dragonesque look. So that's why the dragon name. They're found in usually very heavily dense forested mountainous areas. So the mountain horn dragon. So when you think about, you know, forests of Southeast Asia, we're thinking a little bit cooler, very high humidity, that kind of like rolling fog that goes through with that really nice, dense green jungle. And a lot of that is the same for most of these species. So when we think about keeping them, we're going to think of uh, a terrarium that needs to be a little bit height because they are fairly arboreal. They have pretty long spread out fingers and the claws that are great for climbing. They will spend time on the ground, and oftentimes if you go out and look around, you'll find them blending in with trees and branches near water sources, so that high humidity, a big fresh water bowl for a water source from them, usually eating insects that are flying near the water, so insectivores. So a large aquarium with a little bit of height for climbing, insectivores, so a nice varied diet of dusted and calcium dusted, uh, vitamin and calcium dusted, I got it. Uh, insects, varied diet on that part. They are diurnal, so just like a bearded dragon, they do need nice UVA and UVB sunlight, a low wattage UVB bulb. A good example of that is this Vivtex Sure Sun. So again, in that very heavily dense forested area, that's the sun gets broken up a lot through the canopy, but it does still come down, just not in as high amounts as like the bright sun as like a full basking lizard. So something like this that's low wattage, that's good for those dense jungle animals, 
is a really good idea for that. And if you want to go get a discount on this, you can get 15% off if you use my affiliate code, Jay-Z's Reps 322. If you go to their website and plug it in, you get 15% off. So you should absolutely go check this out. Um, a little bit of a basking spot as well. Nothing really high, like, you know, 90, 92 is probably good for them. Um, another thing that is really cool about these guys is while young ones and, you know, imports, although more people are starting to breed them, they're getting more popular and it's really cool to see. Um, they can be very flighty as little guys, but if worked with and being patient, they can be as handleable as bearded dragons. And honestly, as someone who has a bit of a for bearded dragons for the most part, it's definitely an animal that I think would be really cool. Um, but the way I have this building set up, I have very limited room in my uh, Southeast Asian gecko, Asian rat snake building for a larger terrarium. So that'll be something that I'll have to think about way in the future if I ever decide to go in a different direction for that building. The last one on the list is what I think is honestly the most controversial and it's for a similar reason to the one that's been shared through a lot of these, and that is to do with the wild versus captive bred animals. And so this one is actually another group of animals because again, they share very similar husbandry needs and where they are found in the wild is also fairly similar. And that is the Candoya boas. And so that is a genus of boas that are found in the Pacific Islands. They're often found in islands like the Solomon Islands, San Isabel, parts of Indonesia, and a few others. There are uh, several different species of them and the common names for them get messed up a lot between changes in taxonomy as we've discussed heavily in like the North American rat snakes video, as well as improper and misproperly and mislabeled animals that are coming from exporters and importers. So essentially the Solomon Island ground and tree boas, the viper boas, the Indonesian boas, they're all kept very similarly with a few tweaks here and there. So like the Solomon Island, the Santa Isabel ground boas, they need to be kept very humid, some room for them to climb. They're all, with the exception of the Indonesian tree boa, very small. They usually are stay around four feet in length. They have several different color morphs and localities. The Indonesian tree boa is the largest of all of the candoya. They can reach lengths of well over five feet and are the most arboreal of all of them. And the viper boa, which is probably the most famous one, who gets its name for very obvious reason, it looks like a little puff adder, is the smallest. They rarely exceed two feet in length and they are the most sedentary. They stay on the ground, so out of all of them, they're the one that needs the least amount of climbing. However, some few heavier set like half logs or big cork tubes will be perfect for them as well, although they like to stay buried and you won't really see them a whole lot. Cooler temps again, plenty of humidity, lots of humid hides. The reason why, here's the part where I think it's a little controversial, is all of these animals are very heavily imported. So most animals that we see in the trade are imports. Sometimes there are some, you know, long-term captive bred animals, which is great, and we'll talk about that in a second, or, and there are very few actual captive born and bred animals. So a lot of the animals are field collected or they come from a farm, which is essentially just a lot of times like a designated area in the wild where they know where the animals are continuously staying and they'll just collect from them. Um, those are oftentimes riddled with parasites. They can be very easily stressed. And a lot of times they come in very young and they don't have a great survivability rate in captivity. So that's why they're not really great for a lot of novice keepers. And even for someone who's like me, who d has had a lot of experience keeping a lot of different species of reptiles, I've never really messed with wild caught. And so that would be a whole other ball game for me that I would have to fumble my way through. So that's why I personally say, look for the long-term captives or captive bred animals. They're usually more expensive, but they are more established, they're more stable, and they're more used to handling of people. So a long-term captive or a captive bred animal of like say a Solomon Island ground boa or a San Isabel tree boa is an amazing pet reptile or pet snake for someone who likes boas, a different shaped animal because their head and their body shape looks very different from what we initially think of a boa. It's because you know, we all think of the boa constrictors. It looks very different and they're a small, easily handleable animal that does do very well, again, with the long-term captive or captive bred animals. So that's, there you go. That's the reason why I think that one's a little bit more controversial. I know I keep saying that, but 
again, for a lot of these videos, I like to highlight some of the ones that we, a lot of times we think about like the gargoyle geckos and some of the ones that we may not have even heard about that can be good alternatives or better, not necessarily better, but good ideas for other reptile pets to keep some, some diversity in this hobby. Because I think it would be a lot better if we can start to branch out away from like, you know, the solid set 10 that we all usually keep of, and I'm guilty of as well, I probably have all of those. Um, that and we get a little bit of diversity in there so we can have people starting to work with these really cool and unique species that their care isn't necessarily difficult they're just not as popular if we can get that going we can have an amazing hobby for people coming up into it have to continue hopefully everyone enjoy this video if you can go check out the podcast check out my patreon if you have any questions comments concerns please let me know down in the comments you can email me at jz's jzs reptiles at gmail.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Again, if, if you're interested in, in those VivTech products that I mentioned before, um, I've thrown up a couple different videos about them. Go click on their link down in the description of this video as well as several other ones. And remember to use my affiliate code because it helps me out, helps them out, lets them know that people are hearing from other people in the hobby for ideas about better products to use for their animals. Hope everyone's having a great day and we will check you next time.